Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Tempe joins a list of Arizona cities with ordinances protecting the LGBT community. And we'll hear about the use of effluent as a framework for water sustainability in the state. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. A new poll shows that 45% of Arizonans support gay marriage. 32% of those questions say they do not support same-sex marriage, but would be in favor of civil unions. The survey was conducted by public policy polling. It also shows that 70% agreed with the governor's decision to veto a controversial bill that would have allowed discrimination against gays and lesbians. One day after the veto of Senate Bill 1062, the city of Tempe passed an ordinance that protects against LGBT discrimination. Among those leading that effort, Tempe Council members Corey Wood, and Colby Granville. Good to have you both here on Arizona Horizon. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Let's talk about this city ordinance now. What exactly does it do? One of the things that it does is it protects the LGBT community as well as military veterans from discrimination when it comes to employment, housing, public accommodation. Uh, you can have a fine levied against you of up to $1,500 to $2,500 for some kind of infraction. Uh, but the main thing is it tries to make sure that we're codifying things that had frankly been set into motion by previous councils in terms of, uh, you know, an openness when it comes to city contracts. And it's just making sure that when people come into Tempe, they feel absolutely welcome and they know uh, they're not going to be fired for being gay. They're not going to be discriminated against for being gay or a military veteran. Sexual orientation along with religion, age, those sorts of things all on the same level here? That's exactly right. You know, there's a usual list of that from the 1970s or 80s that you're used to seeing, you know, and you see the race, uh, national origin, you go down the list, gender. And, and the thing that I think is uh, exciting, not just in Tempe, but across the United States, is that we now understand that that list from the 70s or 80s is an incomplete list. And that we're sort of doing the, the, the finishing work now to add uh, sexual orientation and gender identity as well as veteran status to that list of sort of usual suspects. And this, this uh, city employment, this was, was this always in place regarding city employment or was it something that needed to be again codified mm -hmm along now with private development, private uh, mm -hmm. employment and such. Th this was something that we've long had in practice in terms of our actual City of Tempe policies, mm -hmm. but we really did feel like it was something that needed to be codified into ordinance and sort of extended a little bit further, uh, but also mainly to make a statement. I mean, we've unfortunately, you know, been on, you know, sh parody shows like The Daily Show and The Colbert Report for years and as Arizonans uh, for things that we don't like to highlight. This is one of the things that I think will obviously show the other side of Arizona, people who don't actually share some of the opinions we've seen down by some of our Arizona legislators. Talk about this particular effort, how it got started. Oh gosh, it went back about, uh, I've been on council about two years, and uh, the initial thing that brought it to my mind was the Bisbee vote about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And I uh, talked to our sort of allies, and I talked to friends and looked at that, talked to our legal counsel in the city of Tempe. That then led to discussions uh, for Corey and I about, you know, what sort of the things that look like they're within the purview of what we can and should do. Um, and then uh, the Human Rights Campaign, HRC, came out with a, a quality index about six months ago. They rated Phoenix 100%, as a matter of fact. Um, Tempe did very, very well. I think we were in the high 70s. We were the second or third highest city in the state of Arizona. And to Corey and I, we looked at it and just thought, this is our shopping list. Really, they've told us what the new normal is, and it's time we rose to the challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, is that how you saw it as well? Exactly. I mean, one of the things, I think we were actually a 72, and a lot of folks, Tempe is known for being a very progressive community. So a lot of folks actually contacted folks like myself and Colby and said, I'm surprised that Tempe only you know, has that low of a score. And so we immediately started looking at doing certain things that would not only kind of raise the score, uh, but also extend benefits and protections to people who've deserved them for quite some time. Okay, it protects contracts. Mm -hmm. Explain that aspect of the ordinance. The, the main thing is you have to prove when you're doing business with the city of Tempe that you're not discriminating against people for you know LGBT status or military veteran status or some of the things that Colby mentioned before such as age and race some of the things that we've come to know uh, we don't actually impose criminal penalties but we do have civil penalties the main thing I would say as well is that we're not trying to really find people we're trying to educate people about the process which is why this ordinance uh, doesn't go into effect until March 29th religious organizations how are they affected by the ordinance uh, religious organizations aren't. So if there's some particular reason about your, um, and it's not, this is different than SB 1062 where your religious understanding is a personal private thing. In the case of Tempe, what we're talking about is a structured organization. Um, and so if the organization itself 
if there's something about that 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 is it's contrary to the beliefs of that group then they could still be excluded from that. So if a church, for example, wanted to exclude someone based on their belief system, this is different than 1062, of course, which said, I'm a religion of one, and therefore I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. With that in mind, uh, uh, membership clubs, associations mm -hmm. in general? Correct. And that's the usual list. What we really did is we looked to Phoenix, Tucson, Pier City, San Francisco, and said, what is it they do? What have they, frankly, um, dealt the bugs out of a little bit? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing to get to the new normal, um, it's another thing to sort of open yourself up to litigation, which may or may not uh, be where you want to be. There has been concern regarding bathroom policies here in the state in the past. How does this ordinance address those? It, it, it doesn't, you know, have anything. I mean, I think the bathroom bill, frankly, was something that was just uh, an unfortunate sort of uh, way that the, the Phoenix ordinance was characterized. I mean, it protects people when it comes to public accommodation, employment, uh, housing issues. The reality is, I mean, people when they, uh, Colby made a comment about this at one point in the paper that that, you know, people can sort of think what they want, but the reality is when you come to Tempe, you're not allowed to act on certain things. You're not allowed to tell someone that they can't come into your store and purchase something because they happen to be gay or lesbian. And I think that's a very important message to, spend, to send, especially in the year 2014. Uh, school districts uh, apply there at all? It, it doesn't actually apply to school districts, mm -hmm. no. No, it's not to school districts. No. Okay, um, as far as implementation, are we looking at a cost factor here? That's a great question. You know, one of the things that Councilman Woods and I both talked about, and we talked with Phoenix and Tucson and other places and said, what is this costing you? I mean, how many suits are being brought forward? Is this a $5,000 a year item or a $50,000 a year item? And what those cities did, which we adopted as well, is really the first step is when something is brought forward is to go to a mediation, to go to a chance for people to sit down at a table and like Corey said, to educate. Because our goal isn't to punish people. Our goal is to get uh, a city that's inclusive. And so what we found is in the case of Phoenix and Tucson, the costs were minimal, th thousands of dollars, if that at all. Okay. That, that they've made, you know, maybe they've had, you know, one or two cases that have actually even gone to mediation. But one of the things that we had to talk to the business community about, the tourism community, and a lot of folks up front was, we have not seen a rash of lawsuits against small businesses that have put them out of business. Frankly, these things have gone into place. They've been, you know, enacted very smoothly. And you get, you know, maybe one or two or three cases at most that have actually even, you know, reached the mediation stage. What kind of public input did you have on on this. Were there hearings? What did you hear? Was there opposition? What did you hear? That's a great question. So this is one of the things I think is the most exciting part about uh, Tempe, which makes Tempe in some ways unique from the legislature, unique from the case of the city of Phoenix where they had 500 people come out and speak. Passing this in Tempe was frankly a yawn. It was a seven to zero vote. Um, there was no one who showed up to speak against it. And it, for myself and I'm sure for Councilman Woods and the rest of the city council and the residents of Tempe, it's really a point of pride to say, you know what? We're already there, and this is just a codification of the beliefs that we've had for quite a while. Back to something you had said earlier mm -hmm. regarding when you come to Tempe, there are certain things you can do and certain things you can't do because you've entered the public arena, you've entered right. the public square, if you will. Why not, let's go back to 1062 here, sure. why not protect those who have sincerely held beliefs against doing X, Y, or Z in the public square. Well, I think as Governor Brewer talked about even in her veto, there are currently existing state laws on the books that actually protect people uh, that have sort of religious freedom built into them. And that Senate Bill 1062 was sort of in, was sort of excess. It was actually repeating something that are actually already was on the books. So, which is why she actually vetoed it. So from my perspective, I mean, there can be basic religious protections that we actually outline them in our ordinance. Um, but at the same time, you know, we don't want someone saying, well, because of my religion, I'm not gonna pick someone up with a cat or or sell them a cake at a bakery or something of that nature. We just that's not that's not the kind of Tempe that we want and I don't think that's the kind of Tempe that our residents want. And yet critics will say or those who support a 1062 will say that people should not be forced to act against their faith, their quote unquote sincerely held beliefs. How did you take all that and how do you apply all that to an ordinance like this? Yeah, I've heard that argument before with uh, slavery and with the roles of women um, and with the roles of minorities and with the roles of uh, the sincerely held belief argument has been used since the beginning of time. Um, and the, of course, the difficulty is that is sometimes you're just on the wrong side of history. And I think that's the case here. I think that's going to be ultimately the case with 1062, which is why I was so glad it was vetoed, is look, what you think is your own business. But when you interact in the public sphere, we have certain social mores of the way everyone should be treated. And you mentioned there wasn't much uh, called a yawner there as far as uh, getting it through <laughs> it the council. Uh, no opposition. Have you heard anything since the ordinance passed? I have gotten three emails. So imagine a city of 165,000, three emails. How and, about and, you? And I've gotten none. And I would say, but part of that is, 
it might have actually looked easy in the public sphere as it relates to our, our meetings, but a lot of that was because there was a lot of work done in advance by, you know, by council and staff to meet with groups like the Tempe Chamber, uh, the you know, Tempe Tourism Office, and a lot of other people, um, equality groups such as like, you know, Quality Arizona or Lambda Legal or the HRC, to kind of get support for this in advance, to work out those la all, the, all the language issues. And frankly, there was a lot of work done by council's past. I mean, Neil Giuliano, who's really a paragon, whatever, in Tempe in terms of, I mean, people like Neil and a lot of folks before us, a lot of councils worked to make sure that by the time this actually came to pass, it was pretty easy to get through. All right. Well, gentlemen, it's good to have you both on the program. A lot of things happening there in Tempe. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining Great. us. Thank, Thank you, Ted. At the entrance of Bullhead City's Community Park on State Route 95 is a marker honoring Northeastern Arizona's vital relationship with the Colorado River. For nearly 30 years in the mid-1800s, commercial steamships served the mining communities of Northern Arizona, hauling supplies from as far down river as Yuma. Cargo was unloaded at nearby Hardyville, often returning downstream with barge loads of local ore. Bull's Head Rock, from which Bullhead City derived its name, was located just upstream. The escarpment was used as a navigation marker and the point where Mojave Indians forded the river. Bull's Head Rock was submerged in 1953 with the building of Davis Dam. Today, the Colorado is still Bullhead City's lifeblood. Jet skis have replaced the steamships, and Laughlin, Nevada's casinos just across the river have replaced the mines, mining tourist wallets instead of the ore from the mountains. ASU's Decision Center for a Desert City recently released a report on water reuse in central Arizona and how best to use effluent as part of the state's water sustainability plans. Dave White is the co-director of Decision Center for a Desert City. He joins us now. Good to have you here on Arizona Horizon. Thank you, Ted. It's great to be here. Before we get started, what is Decision Center for a Desert City? What's that all about? Thank you for asking. Um, we are a unit of the Global Institute of Sustainability at ASU, so it's a research center. We're focused on the issues of water sustainability and helping to improve the decisions that are made about the future of this critical resource in our state. And this report now is Water Reuse in Central Arizona. Talk to us about the report and how you'd like to see it used. Mm -hmm. Well, the report was developed by our research center, uh, authored, I should say, by Ariana Medell, Ray Quay, and myself from DCDC, as we call it. Mm -hmm. And the focus of the report is really to continue and stimulate an ongoing dialogue in the policy community about issues critical to water sustainability uh, for the future of our state. So there have been a number of reports from places like the Morrison Institute for Public Policy, from the governor's office, had a blue ribbon, blue, blue ribbon panel on water sustainability, and we're kind of trying to continue that dialogue and push the conversation about particular critical issues, in this case, the idea of water reuse. Let's get a definition here. Mm -hmm. What does water reuse mean? Well, there have been times in the past where wastewater, the water that is produced uh, as uh, a waste product from homes and businesses was thought of as just that, a waste product to be disposed of. But increasingly, communities around the United States are seeing this as a critical resource to be reused for beneficial purposes, including industrial purposes, urban irrigation, agricultural irrigation, groundwater recharge, and other purposes. So it's seen as an important management strategy to stretch our existing water supply. And I used the word effluent like I knew mm -hmm. what I was talking about. Sure. I think I know what effluent mm -hmm. is. Give me a definition. Effluent is simply a treatment, a type of water that has been, wastewater that's been treated to a particular standard, right? So we can talk about wastewater that flows from homes and businesses, goes to wastewater treatment plants. And then that water be, can be treated to a variety of different qualities or levels for different types of uses, for uses on golf courses, in lakes and ponds and fountains, or it can be treated to higher level uses that involve human contact. It can also be treated to the level of indirect potable reuse, where we're adding that treated effluent to 
other water supplies and then eventually reusing that water for human consumption. Now can you use effluent for recharging aquifers? Is there a concern mm -hmm. there? And why isn't, if there's not, why not? Absolutely we can. In fact, that's one of the important uses of our municipal effluent is to use that water. We inject it into what's called the Vado zone. So we let it percolate down mm -hmm. through the, the ground into the groundwater supply. And it's purified by natural processes in that way. And so it's an excellent way to take excess water that's being produced through the wastewater system and recharge those aquifers to help create a buffer or a bank of water for future use. Is that happening right? I know golf courses mm -hmm. and irrigation and these sorts of things we're seeing treated water there, mm -hmm. but are, are we actually seeing this groundwater recharge mm -hmm. right now with effluent? Yes, this is occurring right now in Arizona. It's one of the major uses of uh, the treated effluent is for groundwater recharge. The biggest uses are for irrigated agriculture, and so treating the municipal effluent to a certain standard and then it can be applied directly to crops such as cotton. Um, it can also be used for, for urban agriculture, urban irrigation for lawns mm -hmm. and golf courses. It can be recharged into the aquifer um, or it can be used for instance for industrial cooling processes such, at the, such as at the Arizona uh, Public Service Nuclear generating station. I would imagine that that, uh, that power plant out there uses a lot of water. Is, mm -hmm. is a lot of it effluent? Is a lot of it w treated water? Absolutely. In fact, they take about 80,000 uh, acre feet of water. An acre foot is the amount of water used to flood one acre of land to the depth of one foot. Or it's about the amount of water that would be used for two households in a year in Arizona. 80,000 acre feet a year going to the Palo Verde Nuclear Generating Station for their cooling purposes. And in fact, they're one of the largest users of municipal effluent. They're one of the largest nuclear power plants not located on a permanent body of water. So it's an excellent example of how we can take this reused water and put it to use to support, in this case, power generation in our community. I, I know that from your report, it, it sounded like uh, the, the cost concerns are there, mm -hmm. but they are there for an interesting reason in mm -hmm. that competition for water kind of finds its own level, if you right. will, and impacts everything, doesn't it? Absolutely. What we're seeing is we're seeing the potential for increased competition, increased cost for municipal effluent into the future. And one of the important things that we try to achieve in this report is to set up a policy dialogue to encourage a conversation just with our raw water or surface water supplies from the Salt and Verde River systems or from the Colorado River. We want people to have an open, transparent dialogue about what are the best and highest uses of this municipal effluent. Should we be using it, for instance, to support the golf course industry in North Scottsdale, right? That provides important economic benefits and tourism dollars. Should we be use it for cooling the power plant? Should we be use it for recharging the aquifer? Just like our regular water supplies, we're going to come into a place where we don't have enough water for every beneficial purpose. And indeed, and back to the cost, if something happens, if the competition means that all of a sudden groundwater winds up cheaper mm -hmm. than effluent, that's not a good thing. Right, we want to, in the central Arizona area, encourage policies, behaviors, incentivize the conservation of our groundwater aquifer, and the main policy framework for the state does just that. It's one of the most progressive groundwater conservation laws in the United States, it was passed in 1980, but if it were passed today, it would be one of the most progressive groundwater conservation laws. And so we want to keep that supply as a buffer for times of drought and to mitigate and adapt to the potential impacts of climate change. I was going to ask about drought and climate change. How much was that factored into what you guys were reporting on? We were considering that very carefully. One of the reasons we wrote this report is that several commissions, boards, and other reports have focused on the issue of climate change. And one of the common conclusions is we must increase the amount of water reuse as a strategy to deal with potential supply deficits into the future that may occur as the result of climate change impacts or drought or population growth. So while we agree wholeheartedly with this as a primary policy goal, we want to point out some of the challenges that we need to address. 
thinking about competition, thinking about costs, thinking about dealing with the increasing concern over contaminants like pharmaceuticals and other contaminants in the wastewater supply. Mm -hmm. Let's deal with those now so that we can use this important supply. Are we dealing with those now? Yeah, absolutely. There are a number of important organizations both at the university and in the cities and in the regulate, regulators, the Department of Water Resources, who are focused on exactly those concerns. What are the appropriate levels for things like pharmaceuticals that are making their way into that wastewater supply? We're able to detect those at a much smaller and smaller concentrations now, but we yet have developed environmental quality standards for many of those pharmaceuticals, either at the federal or state level. Last question here, and this just involves perception. How do, is it a concern and is it an issue with the yuck factor, if Absolutely. you will? The fact that folks hear effluent, they hear wastewater, they mm -hmm. hear treated water, and they say, I, get, that, get that stuff away from me. I think one of the things that's changing over time is Arizonans are increasingly coming to grips with the idea that we should use the appropriate water quality for the appropriate use. Right? We don't need to use our potable water supply for watering our lawns, for instance, or for watering our golf courses. So I think people are really coming to grips with there are different qualities of water, including treated wastewater, that make sense to use in different purposes. Will we in Arizona reach a point where, like in California and Florida, we come to a place of direct potable reuse, where we treat that wastewater and return it directly to the drinking water plants, mm -hmm. the, the water treatment plants for delivery to the households? It's, it's possible. It's not in the immediate future, but it's possible, and I think people will come to grips with that over time. All right. Great information. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. And tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, our weekly political update is here with the Arizona Capital Times, and we'll look at a new report on the economic self-sufficiency of low-income Arizona women. That is tomorrow at 5.30 on the next Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.